your weight presentation, darling. This is BTV, your home for memorable energy. We are going to have a really nice week ahead. It's going to be mostly sunny, dry, and also the temperatures are going down a little bit, along with the humidity falling. I'll have all those details coming up. Now at 10, honoring the fallen across the CSRA on this Memorial Day, we take you to a ceremony held in the area and show you how our nation's heroes are being remembered. Also ahead, how a local animal shelter could be expanding. And a local organization is spreading awareness and resources about lupus, how they're planning to save lives as your news at 10 starts now. Live from Television Park, this is WJBF News Channel 6 at 10 on BTV. Good evening, everyone. I'm Hannah Latier. Thank you so much for joining us. Coverage you can count on begins with a look to ceremonies across the CSRA that were held today to honor American heroes. One of them was in downtown Augusta at the All Wars Monument. The ceremony brought together veterans across several military branches, along with those currently serving. Mayor Garnett Johnson and Congressman Rick Allen both made remarks, along with poor Eisenhower Major General Paul Stanton. Mike Culbertson led in the singing of God Bless America and says Memorial Day stands out from the other military holidays celebrated throughout the year. Because Veterans Day, the veterans can, can still speak it for, for, for themselves. You know, that, Veterans Day is for the people who have served. Um, our Forces Day is for the people who are serving. Memorial Day is for the people who went to, went to war and didn't come back. And a lot of people don't, don't understand the differences between those. Like that memorial says, those attending today's ceremony say it's important to remember that all veterans gave some, but some gave it all. A local animal shelter could be expanding with the help of University of Georgia engineering students. I spoke with county leaders about what they're hoping for. There's one thing that rural communities don't have a shortage of, and that's stray cows. The McDuffie County Animal Shelter had its grand reopening two months ago, but the shelter has been at capacity for a while now, and county leaders are looking toward its future. There's a program that we're a member of called the Archway Partnership out of the University of Georgia. It's a, an effort they have at, at the college to help rural communities with projects that we probably wouldn't have the resources to do. How it works is you come up with an idea, and then that idea is sent to the University of Georgia, and students undertake the planning part of it. A few weeks ago, those engineering students presented the county with the full project layout. Soil samples, it has architectural renderings, it has possibility for sewer layout, it has, uh, it, it's super in-depth, super thorough. It's probably one of the most thorough presentations from the archway program I've ever seen. The new shelter would be built on property adjacent to the current building and would have more than double the space. The current shelter would still be used as an intake building. The obstacle is getting the funding for the more than $2 million project if it's approved by the county commission. There's grants, there could be fundraisers, there could be sales tax dollars on down the road. Um, you know, we'll look at every available option we can. Smith hopes the project goes through so the shelter can stay a no-kill shelter. We still do not want to ever, if we can help it, uh, euthanize for space purposes. And so far, we haven't had to. Um, but that's always a challenge in a small rural community like this. And Smith says the proposal should be going to the county's board of commissioners in the next month or so. It's time now for a first look at our weather. Here's meteorologist Jenna Petracci. And Jenna, it was a weird weather day for some of our viewers. Yeah, Hannah, so earlier today we did have some showers and thunderstorms, but the majority of the day was nice and dry, and luckily that threat of severe weather is now over with. As we take a look across the CSRA, not a drop of rain across our area, but notice southern Georgia lit up with severe thunderstorms, torrential rain, and frequent lightning. This has been going on over the past several hours, and fortunately for us here in the CSRA, all of this activity dodged us, staying to our south. So once again, there is no longer a threat of severe weather across our area. Today, Augusta actually didn't pick up any rain. Our high today was 88, so that puts us right at average. And our low temperature was 10 degrees above average in those low 70s this morning. All right, Terry Lambert Hyundai Skyview Cam showing dry conditions across the area with temperatures in those low to upper 70s. 73 in Augusta, 79 in Barnwell, Millen at 76, 74 in Louisville. Reidsville, you're at 74, 75.
75 in Lincolnton and 73 in Sandersville. Dew points around 70 degrees, definitely a muggy Monday evening with those winds coming in from the southwest. The winds have definitely settled down earlier today. We had gusts up to 25 miles per hour. Right now it's only 7 miles per hour sustained in Aiken. Gusts only up to around 15. Satellite and radar showing a cold front coming through the CSRA with all the activity ahead of it. Behind that cold front, we have the dry, cooler air. So for tomorrow, still a warm day, but those temperatures will begin to drop just a little bit throughout the rest of the week. So starting out tomorrow morning in those mid to upper 60s, 70 at the 8 o'clock hour. High of 90 for Tuesday, 88 on Wednesday, but then a high of 83 on Thursday. So a little bit of a cool down for you. Coming up, I'll have a full look at that 10-day forecast. So stay with us. We're back to you, Hannah. All right, Jenna, thank you so much. Coverage you can count on continues tonight with a local organization giving mental health resources for people with lupus. Nikita Dennis live in the Satellite News Center with more. Nikita? Yeah, lupus warriors are coming together to share knowledge for lupus and mental health awareness month, hoping to save lives. But oftentimes, the reality is there's so many patients and families and just the community at large that they separate the two. But the two go hand in hand. Chronic lupus is hoping to help people battling the autoimmune disease of better their mental health. The nonprofit, along with Wellstar MCG Health and other organizations, will host a panel discussion Wednesday at Aiken Health, sharing knowledge on lupus and mental health. We really just want to be not only that voice, but we want to be your foot to the ground um, organization that is providing financial, mental. Um, physical, social um, assistance for lupus patients and their families. The goal is to provide resources to lupus warriors and anyone else needing mental health guidance. Our goal is to give the community resources about mental health, how it impacts autoimmune diseases, specifically lupus, and then continue the conversation with their family and with their friends. Lilia says it's also about being able to recognize signs of mental health for lupus patients. So for anyone with autoimmune, um, I always tell patients that are battling uh, lupus as well as other autoimmune diseases that it's not a matter of if you're going to experience depression, if you're going to experience uh, anxiety. You can head over to our website at WJBS.com to learn more about the discussion panel. Live in the Satellite News Center, I'm Nikita Dennis, WJBS News Channel 6. Nikita, thanks. It's become one of the hottest drugs on the market, labeled as the best solution to help with weight loss. However, a new study is showing medications like Ozempic are seeing an incredibly sharp increase in use among young people. A group of researchers who discovered there was a 59% increase in teens being prescribed weight loss medication in the past three years. Prescriptions written for, for people between 12 and 25 increased from 8,722 to 60,567. The increase felt more in the southern states like North Carolina and were seen more in women than men. Side effects such as nausea, vomiting, or constipation have been seen in some young people. In the investigation into an inmate's death at Augusta State Medical Prison now have two inmates charged in the death of Roger Hayes. Brendan Lamar Moore and Andy Ulysses have been charged with felony murder and aggravated assault. The correction officer, Lloyd Hopkins, is charged with being party to the murder and assault, among other charges. 29-year-old Roger Hayes died Saturday following the altercation. The official cause of death has yet to be released. Hayes was in prison for several crimes, including sex trafficking and cruelty to children. Stay with us. Tomorrow begins early voting in South Carolina, which you need to know after the break. And the severe thunderstorm threat is over with, and we'll have dry and sunny conditions to look forward to this week, along with a slight drop in temperatures. All those details when we return. The death of my rating black X 365 on your news channel stands. For years, Freddie the Forecaster has been a true friend to our community. Enter to win 
your very own Freddy Bobblehead today at WJBF.com. Sponsored by Alpha Insurance. Now, your most accurate forecast with WJBF Live Viper 6. Welcome back. Here's another check of radar. Still nothing going on across the CSRA. Once again, that severe weather threat is over. All the shower and storm activity well to our south, and we are nice and dry this evening. As we take a look at our Terry Lambert Hyundai Skyview cam outside the station, a pleasant, muggy evening, though. 73 degrees, dew point of 69. Winds are calm, and we're seeing those low to mid-70s, and even some upper 70s. 79 in Barnwell, Allendale, and Bamberg. Aiken, you're at 76, 74 in McCormick, 75 in Wayne and 73 out towards Crawfordville. Notice all of that activity down towards the south, lighting up southern Georgia, down to the Florida Panhandle as well. Severe thunderstorm warnings ongoing with those gusty winds and hail. It's all part of this cold front that's moving through. Behind it, we have clear skies. So notice the orange color here. That's all the dry air that will be moving in over the next couple of days. Last day of school tomorrow for Bamberg and McCormick counties, starting out in those mid-60s. It will be a beautiful day. A hot one, though, climbing into the upper 80s in some spots, even at 90 degrees tomorrow. Dew points will still be high in those upper 50s, but definitely a little bit lower, especially on Wednesday and Thursday. We will be back into the comfortable range, no longer feeling muggy. So tomorrow's another very hot day, but then the high temperatures will actually go below average with those highs around 83 to 85 degrees and the low temperature is taking a big dip as well. So 66 tonight, but then 56 going into our weekend. So a little bit of a cooler, crisper start to the day there. Our feature cast tonight at midnight showing the cold front moving through with showers and storms focused along the coastline, then moving out to sea. Northwest wind coming in behind the front and plenty of sunshine expected over the next couple of days. Just some passing clouds here and there, but definitely no chance of rain all the way through Saturday. Our low temperatures tonight will be in those mid to upper 60s, and our high temperatures tomorrow will be in the upper 80s to around 90 degrees. Here's a look at your 10-day forecast. We will have beautiful dry weather all of this week. Overall, pretty quiet. Once again, a high of 90 tomorrow. Lows in the low 60s for now, but then as we go into the middle and end of the week, our high temperatures falling into those low to mid 80s. Our low temperatures will fall into the upper 50s. 56 for Saturday morning, a nice dry start to the weekend, and then just some isolated storms Sunday into next week. So overall, looking good, Hannah. Looking good, but I feel like it's been super stormy lately. It has. We're definitely getting into that summer-like storm pattern, but overall, pretty nice I'm week. not too mad about it. I like nice storms sometimes. <laughs> well, thank you, Jenna. Early voting begins for the South Carolina primaries tomorrow. Voters can cast their ballots in the Republican or Democratic primary and will choose nominees in races for the State House and Senate and U.S. House. Some counties in our area will also vote for sheriff and other local offices. Early voting centers will be open from 8.30 a.m. until 5 on weekdays through June 7th. Primary day is June 11th. Still ahead, a change at the federal level in how marijuana is classified. A closer look as your news continues. CSRA do extraordinary things to serve our community. Each month, News Channel 6 recognizes these outstanding volunteers with the Giving Your Best Award. Do you know an everyday hero who goes the extra mile to help others? Nominate them for the Giving Your Best Award by visiting WJBF.com and filling out the entry form. Sponsored by Science Co., Pete Augusta, Security Federal Bank, and News Channel 6. gives you the sky view now. Get a live view of traffic and weather from all over the CSRA. Available online 24 hours a day at WJBF.com and a free Live Viper 6 mobile app. The WJBF Live Viper 6 Sky View Network. Powered by Terry Lambert Hyundai. Low prices, big selection, and committed to quality customer service. 
a federal proposal that would reclassify marijuana as a Schedule III drug could have an impact on who can get it legally in Georgia. Our Chip Sashadri has that story. It's a crime to have marijuana in Georgia, whether you buy it, sell it, or plan to manufacture it. But there's a renewed push by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration to reclassify marijuana as a less dangerous drug. While it wouldn't legalize it for recreational purposes, the Justice Department's proposal would recognize the medical benefits of cannabis. It would allow, as soon as that federal regulation change occurs, for marijuana to be prescribed and dispensed for medical use at dispensaries across Georgia. It would not impact recreational use, although there are cities and counties that have already decriminalized minor use possession by increasing the penalties that their DAs and their police departments will enforce uh, of an ounce or less. While the proposal is facing pushback from some groups who say marijuana could have adverse health risks, advocates say it could reduce pain for those suffering from cancer, Parkinson's disease, or seizures. I believe there's only three or four operating dispensaries in Georgia at this point, so most people I know who are patients in those ailments, they literally travel to other states, purchase it much more easily, and come back to the It would move marijuana from Schedule 1, the same category as LSD or heroin, to a Schedule 3 drug along with steroids, which isn't as strictly regulated. So, driver safety is probably the number one if it were suddenly broadly, much more broadly used. And then you've got workplace safety issues because, you know, there's warehouses, there's people who work on locomotives, there are large truck drivers, and, and when things are decriminalized, they are broadly adapted very quickly, and sometimes not everyone's system is able to cope with that. There is a two-month public comment period before the changes are finalized. Reporting in Atlanta, Archip Sashadri, Atlanta Bureau Chief. Coming up, the Braves are without their star player due to injury, and the NCAA baseball tournament regionals were announced in one conference made history. Here at Goldstein has sports next. WGBF sports coverage you can count on. Matchups for the 2024 NCAA baseball tournament were announced on Monday, and one conference set a record for the number of teams vying for a college world series. That conference is, of course, the SEC, with five nationally ranked teams and six unranked teams all making it into the tournament. The Southeastern Conference has entered the record books yet again. The 11 SEC teams in the 2024 NCAA tournament is the most teams from a single conference to make it in a given year, and the SEC is breaking its own record of 10, which was set just last year. So let's get a look at the opening matchups for the ranked teams. The winners of the SEC tournament, number one Tennessee, will be taking on Northern Kentucky. Kentucky faces Western Michigan. The number three Aggies take on Grambling. Arkansas is facing Southeast Missouri State, and the seventh ranked Georgia Bulldogs will face Army to open tournament play. For more information on these matchups and the six other teams included in this, also the defending champion LSU Tigers, head over to WJBF.com for a full list of SEC matchups. On the ACC side, the Clemson Tigers have also made it into the tournament. The number six overall seed will host number two Vandy, number three Coastal Carolina, and number four High Point in a double elimination regional. All of that excitement starts on Friday inside Doug Kingsmore Stadium. Ronald Acuna Jr. exited Sunday's game against the Pirates after sustaining an injury that would later be determined to be an ACL tear. The Braves organization confirmed on Twitter that Acuna underwent an MRI that revealed a complete tear in his left knee. He's set to undergo surgery, but a date is not set. We wish him a speedy recovery, and he will be out for the remainder of the season. His team certainly missed him on Monday night as they welcomed the Nationals to Truist Park. Charlie Morton got the start on the mound, top of the first no score. Former Brave Eddie Rosario doubles to bring in Lane Thomas, a clutch hit from Rosario in his first at-bat against his old team. Nationals lead 1-0. Later in the inning, Nationals lead 2-0, two, two on for Nick Senzel. He doubles down the left field line to score two, and that marks the first time since 2015 that Charlie Morton allowed four or more runs in the first inning. Nationals up 4-0. Next inning, more trouble for Morton. C.J. Abrams at the plate with nobody on. Abrams sends it deep over the right field wall for a home run. Morton pitched 5.2 innings, giving up eight runs off a career-high 12 hits. Nationals get the win 8-4, to four, game two on Tuesdays at 7.20 p.m. And finally,
family tonight some sad news from the basketball world. Hall of Famer Bill Walton passed away on Monday following a prolonged battle with cancer. At 6'11", Walton was one of the most skilled big men to ever play the game. He was a student of John Wooden at UCLA, where he won two NCAA titles before being drafted number one overall by the Portland Trailblazers in 1974. He won two NBA championships, one in 1977 with the Trailblazers and one in 1986 with the Boston Celtics. After his NBA career, he turned to broadcasting, where he became a beloved analyst covering college and professional basketball. His friends, family, and colleagues all took to social media on Monday to pay tribute to the legend, and our thoughts are with them at this time. Bill Walton was 71 years old. That does it for sports. CSRA agent your voice. Visit WJEF.com slash bring to find out how we can do the same for you. And last but not least, we all have things we want to scratch off the old bucket list, but how many have you really gotten to? And have you done any of them more than once? One high-flying 104-year-old from Central Texas is living out his dreams. He just jumped out of an airplane for the second time. Take a look. Gearing up to jump out of an airplane can be a lot of work. I remember doing all these. Did I sign? Gloves, belts. This is your altimeter. Look at it anytime you want. You'll know how high we are. And you can't forget about the perfect socks. Yep, all set. Come on, you're a At 104 years old, Ernie Columbus is a thrill seeker. And on this day, the thrill takes him thousands of feet into the sky as this World War II veteran went skydiving for the second time. I just decided I, I just I was gonna jump and that was it. Here he is on the way down, enjoying every second of the free fall. Uh, I, I could see everything around. And, and the guy back there was talking with me, and uh, uh, I was all tied up to him. Ernie was paired with Victor Cruci for the jump. He says tandem skydiving has opened the door for some who might not be able to jump alone. It's, it's much easier now with tandem skydiving. We just strap you to somebody who's very, very, very experienced, and we help you along the way. Ernie served in the Army, but after the war, he got into the Air Force, where he served the remainder of his 26-year career. But he never jumped out of an airplane until later in life. And now he's hooked. I didn't know we jumped <laughs> until, until I was out, in the, out, in the, out there. And I was floating for, I guess, about a minute. And then the parachute opened up and then we started coming down. As for if he'll be skydiving anytime soon, I'll let him answer that. Someone asked me if I was going to do it again. I said, I don't know. But I think uh, if the opportunity comes up, I may just do it. Wow. I'm his biggest fan. I, that is so <laughs> cool. He said something that I'm scared of, yeah. and yeah. he did it at such an incredible age. That's amazing. If I was 104, I'd probably skydive too. <laughs> <laughs> he looks 74. He looks like oh, yeah. 30 years younger than And he me. said he might do it again. Good yeah. for him. I need his secret. Yeah. I really do. No, yeah. Wow. 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 Well done. <laughs> Day forecast showing a beautiful week. We have mostly sunny and dry conditions. A hot one tomorrow, 90 degrees, but highs will be going down to the low 80s the rest of the week, and our lows will be going into the mid to upper 50s. So some cooler, crisper mornings along with lower humidity. No chance of rain throughout the next several days. A dry, sunny start to the weekend, and then just some isolated storms around Sunday into next week. So overall, looking pretty good. And the news continues at the top of the hour on WJBF News Channel 6 at 11.